Hello and welcome to Downstream. My name is Aram Bastani. It's great to have you with us. Today we're joined by Labour MP Richard Bergen. Richard ran for the role of deputy leader earlier this year and is the chairman of the left-wing socialist campaign group in Westminster. Richard, welcome to Downstream. Happy New Year. How's life? I'm doing okay. Happy New Year to you. Yes, it's, it's okay. Um, uh, obviously, notwithstanding the, the broader context of, a, of another lockdown, we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, Richard, first question. You've been an MP since 2015, since before Jeremy Corbyn was Labour leader. Where do you see Labour right now? Has it gone backwards, forwards? Are you disappointed? Are you excited? Are you optimistic? I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Well, look, it was bad news for everybody when we got smashed in that election in December. And then, of course, after that, neither the left candidate for leader, Becky, nor the left candidate for deputy, myself, both supported by the Social Campaign Group, neither of us won those elections. And that wasn't good for the left. And then, of course, we've got the economic crisis following in the aftermath of the kind of public health crisis. And both the public health crisis and the economic crisis are once in a century uh, occurrence, uh, we hope, because of course these things could happen uh, again. And within that context, Labour really has got to step up to the plate and offer solutions more than kind of tinkering around the edges, let's return to business as usual. I don't think that kind of approach would be sufficient even outside this coronavirus crisis, even outside this economic crisis as well. So it certainly won't be enough during this crisis. And I think that Anybody who's looking at it objectively can say that Labour and the Labour leadership was way behind the curve when it came to the issue uh, of school closures uh, earlier uh, this week. And lessons need to be learnt uh, from that. There's no political future uh, for Labour uh, or for the left if that's our kind of approach during the crisis. We can't just have this idea that we're going to wait until 2024 and somehow hope uh, that power falls into uh, our hands because one, that's not how elections work, but also there's a public health and economic crisis now. People are dying now. Whilst we're in opposition, we need to be fighting to get concessions and movement from the government that can save lives and save livelihoods in the here and now. So a kind of return to stale centrism isn't going to do, do the job uh, electorally, and it's not going to do the job that needs to be done in terms of uh, fighting for our communities. And I think that's the same challenge that uh, they're going to face our left-wing colleagues in the United States as well, but we might come on to that later. Do you think then that, as I said, you've been a member since of Parliament since 2015? Obviously, that's before Brexit. It was before the rise of Jeremy Corbyn. It was before Trump. Uh, things felt relatively normal for a lot of people. You had David Cameron as the Prime Minister, Ed Miliband as the, as the leader of the opposition. And of course, he, he shortly thereafter uh, stood down. Do you feel like that the sort of mental landscape of people around the Labour leadership, people at the top of the Labour Party, thinks that we're still in that moment? Do you feel like they're kind of ignoring the broader context post-2016, but also including COVID, including the kind of economic aftermath of that? Do you think they're kind of putting their heads in the sand a little bit? I think there are people uh, around the Labour leader and people in the Labour Party who wanted, after something they found quite uncomfortable, rather than exciting the years with a socialist, uh, anti-war internationalist as leader, they wanted to return to the so-called business as usual, a kind of revival act of the mid-90s. But society, the world, the economy, the challenges facing uh, our communities and the world and our country are totally different now to what they were in the mid-1990s and what worked then uh, won't work now. And what works outside a crisis certainly won't work within a crisis. So I think there is a move from some in Labour, including uh, those in the leadership. Maybe they think that the way forward is to try and offend nobody. If you try and offend uh, nobody, I don't think that's the way forward. And Aaron Bevan said that if you walk down the centre of the road, you get run down by traffic on both sides. And I think the debacle of the leadership's response, slow, slow, slow response uh, on school closures is a case in point. It's almost like it felt that some people think that the way to win is to resist saying you support the National Education Union, resist saying you support teachers and school staff, and to resist saying those things in front of a union jack, and that equals you get to become uh, the government in a few years' time. That's not how it works outside a crisis, and it's not how it works 
inside the crisis. Let me come back to you on that point, because I guess the refutation of that argument from people like Keir Starmer or just people around his retinue or supporters of his who are just me- members, lay members, councillors, MPs, they would say, well, people like Richard Berg and Aaron Bastani supported Bernie Sanders, yet Joe Biden beat Donald Trump overwhelmingly in the presidential election. They've also effectively now won the Senate after uh, what happened in Georgia yesterday. They would say that actually Keir Starmer can be more like Joe Biden. Actually, centrism is highly effective at beating populists like Donald Trump. And and over here, they would argue in 2024, Boris Johnson. What's your argument uh, against that? Well, if Boris Johnson's uh, our Donald Trump, I don't think that he's going to be standing uh, in 2024, if that's when the next general election will be. I think that once uh, the COVID crisis uh, is hopefully over, I think the Tories will think he's served his use. He's got Brexit done. Uh, He's... uh, seen them through in a disastrous way through the coronavirus crisis. And I think they'll try and have uh, a refresh. Of course, it was fantastic news when Trump got booted out. That was a fantastic achievement by people who took part in that campaign. But I don't think that the job ends there. For the left in the United States, they're going to have to fight for economic policies that will bring solutions to the working class in all its diversity in the United States, the kind of things that Bernie Sanders, uh, AOC and uh, Ilhan Omar have been arguing for uh, and others. And internationally, the left, I think, will end up in a position where we have to be uh, resisting imperialist uh, foreign policy by the United States. Of course, um, Biden is a huge improvement on Donald Trump. It was great that Trump was uh, booted out. But one could say that the politics of Biden are the politics which gave rise to uh, Trump in the first place. You know, Trump tapped into uh, that stale business as usual politics uh, that Hillary Clinton uh, and others uh, pushed. And so people here say that we've got to own the defeat as the left in 2019. And I do think we need to take collective responsibility for that disastrous defeat in 2019. But very few people say that the Democrats... Uh, like Hillary Clinton, like Joe Biden, should own that defeat uh, that uh, disastrously brought uh, Donald Trump uh, to power Mm. uh, a few years ago. So let me come back to a point you just made there, Richard. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're saying is the bet of the kind of Keir Starmer strategy right now is that Boris Johnson is the prime minister in 2024. And if he is, going for their present approach may succeed, but you think that Boris Johnson won't be the prime minister and therefore this kind of centrist approach being adhered to right now by the Labour leadership, you think that will fail? Is that is that correct? Well, I think that the Tories are very ruthless. I think they'll uh, dump Boris Johnson uh, when it suits them. But even now, sadly, the Tories are ahead in most of the opinion polls. You know, we all remember being told that politics is so simple that if you just change the leader, suddenly you'll be 20 points ahead in the opinion polls. Uh, that hasn't happened. I understand the idea that you offend as few people as possible, you look like a prime minister in waiting and a government in waiting, and you think that uh, government drops into your hand like an apple from the tree uh, in due course in 2024. I don't think that's how it works, especially uh, not uh, in a crisis. There's a whole recalibration of politics in the UK, in the USA, and around the world uh, going on. So that old approach, I don't think, will necessarily work. We want to get Keir Starmer into power. We want to get Labour into power. But we think it's only with transformative left policies that are fit to meet the crisis that people are going through now, this almost unprecedented crisis. We think that's the only way that we're going to break the Conservative stranglehold on power. The 2019 election uh, was uh, a disaster. We all have to take collective responsibility for that, especially those of us in the shadow cabinet. That obviously includes Keir Starmer. Uh, In 2017, Uh, We did very well. We need to build, I think, on those policies from 2017 and 2019, because actually, in the context of a crisis, those kind of policies are more popular than ever before, or more important than ever before, as well as popular. I think it's important to say as well, in the aftermath of the Georgia results, you know, those were built on mass voter registration, the work of Stacey Abrams and community organisers for a very long time. And frankly, there is nothing like that in, in Britain. It certainly doesn't fall within the genre of politics adopted by 
many people that's of the Labour Party. So I would have to have sympathy with your argument. And, and one, one other point I would make, Aaron, is that my Please. fear is that there are those in the Labour Party who will make a classic mistake in politics, which is to take your supporters for granted and go chasing mm. people who will never vote for you. And I don't think that the Labour leadership should take young people for granted. I don't think the Labour leadership should take uh, black and minority ethnic communities uh, for granted. I don't think the Labour leadership should take teachers and school staff for granted. And I don't think the Labour leadership should take trade unionists for granted. I remember hearing years and years ago when they talked about the north of England, uh, Mandelson and the others said, oh, don't worry, they've got nowhere else to go. Well, eventually people do find somewhere else to go, sadly. In Scotland, there's somewhere else to go, ended up being the SNP. In the north of England, there's somewhere else to go, became UKIP and eventually the Tories to, to quote, get Brexit done. And of course, the other place for people to go is to sit on their hands and not vote at all. So I think the Labour leadership has got to be very careful that it doesn't pursue a strategy which ends up losing the support we got in 2017 and 2019, but not building uh, extra support in other parts of the electorate either. That's a real danger. If people want to vote for the Tories, they've got a Tory party to vote for. Do you think that Keir Starmer is taking the sort of core Labour vote from 2017, 2019 for granted? I'm thinking particularly renters, particularly renters, who of course are suffering the most from the COVID crisis. They don't get mortgage holidays. And the NEU, you know, it's, 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 teaching staff are, you know, generally speaking, Labour voters. Do, do you feel like they're being taken for granted by Labour right now? Well, I can't draw any other conclusion uh, than thinking that the leadership was taking teachers and um, school staff for granted uh, over uh, the weekend. How can we have a position where Jeremy Hunt is calling for schools to be closed before the Labour Party leadership? How can we have a situation where the Lib Dems and the Green Party are calling for schools to be closed before the Labour leadership does? You know, that's not encouraging. I hope I'm wrong, but it seems to me it's like, oh, the teachers' votes are in the bag. Let's find some people who love the Tory party. Maybe we can get them to vote for us. And I don't think uh, that's how politics works. And you mentioned uh, renters. And, of course, renters and young people uh, have been, firstly, hit by 10 years of austerity. But all and hit by changes in the economy, and now hit by the uh, coronavirus crisis and the economic crisis, which has gone along with that. We can't take those people for granted. And in a crisis, you can't please everyone. In a crisis in particular, you've got to decide whose side you're on. And I think we should be on the side of the many, not the few. And I think we should also be on the side uh, of the oppressed minorities in society as well. And if it seems like we're not, then I think that's not a good place for the Labour Party to be in. What was the, the Jeremy Corbyn leadership slash projects, because it obviously had uh, far-reaching implications beyond parliamentary politics, was that a complete failure? Because I look at the policy offer in 2017, 2019, in the context of COVID, it's never been more appropriate. I look at how right Jeremy Corbyn was proven on big political calls, like, for instance, the Trump White House, he was right about so much. That politics had never been more appropriate, had never found its time like it had, it felt, like in the late 2010s, and yet it got decimated. So was it a failure? Uh, I, well, it was a failure in terms of we got smashed in the election in 2019 after nearly winning uh, in 2017. But it can't be written off as a failure because of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people became inspired to become left socialist activists during that period. Many of them young people who have decades ahead of political activism to come. So it basically um, lit a flame which others will take forward, I believe, uh, empowered by that experience, but also we've got to learn the lessons of that uh, experience. I don't think that many people uh, when it was decided Jeremy would be the left candidate for leader back in 2015. Not many people thought uh, he would win. And in a way, we kind of skipped a stage due to historical circumstances because what people would have generally predicted would happen is you'd get uh, more and more left-wing Labour Party members, more and more left MPs elected. And then at the last point, you'd then get a left-wing Labour Party leader. But in a strange way, we skipped those first two stages which added its extra difficulties but i think we can learn from 
the experiences of the uh, last five years, uh, both uh, as individuals and uh, collectively as a movement. So I don't think it was uh, can be written off uh, as a failure. Uh, I think a mistake that people could make is to think that just because the left didn't win the leadership and the deputy leadership in 2020, that, that means that the Labour Party is a complete waste of time for the left. People should remember that in 2015, nobody thought that the left would win the Labour Party leadership. Things can yeah. change very quickly. And actually, it was people like Jeremy, John McDonnell and Diane, and many left grassroots Labour activists staying in the party through the Blair years, through the Brown years and through the Miliband years, that actually meant that when that historical moment came, after uh, all those years of austerity, it meant there was a left in place that could put forward the arguments, uh, win that election and take the leadership of the party. In the future, that can happen again, I'm sure of it, as long as people uh, don't uh, just give up. But Richard, that opportunity was wasted. Uh, you're absolutely right. They stayed and they endured all those problems and privations and then the opportunity was wasted. The left had control of the NEC. It had control of the, the, the party leadership. The mass of the members agreed with the policy platform. It had mass legitimacy, actually, from even from much of the media for a few months after the 2017 result. And yet, three and a half years later, the, the, the net legacy is negligible. There's very few left-wing MPs. The policy platform seems to be discarded at a rate of knots. So, I mean, obviously there are some positive consequences, I, 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 indisputable. But if you look at a balance sheet, I mean, it has to be categorised as a failure. Well, we it? didn't achieve what we wanted, which was to have a socialist and or internationalist as prime minister of this country. We came close in 2017. Of course, it breaks our hearts what happened uh, in 2019. You know, that devastating defeat uh, breaks the hearts of everyone who gave so much uh, to that. Uh, but, you know, when you're fighting incredibly powerful forces in the establishment, people shouldn't be naive enough to think uh, that victory is assured and it's easy. Uh, you know, mistakes were made and we need to learn from them. We always need to learn lessons from the struggle. But at the end of the day, what we were talking about, and people shouldn't underestimate this, I don't think it was just because uh, of Jeremy's anti-austerity economic policies that the establishment didn't want him as Prime Minister. We had a situation where if we'd have won the election in either 2017 or 2019, we'd have had, as the leader of the UK, one of the five countries with a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council and with the veto and all that implies, an anti-war internationalist, an anti-imperialist, someone who had opposed the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the intervention uh, in Libya, somebody who believes in an international policy of peace and conflict resolution. If that had happened, it would have actually almost exposed the whole reality of geopolitics. That being that, really, it's the United States quite often on its own uh, in terms of wanting to push certain policies. You'd had a, you'd had a situation where more and more it became the case where it might have only been the United States uh, pushing for um, uh, in, uh, for military uh, interventions uh, and policies uh, of war. So when when that's the situation, you're coming up against tremendously powerful forces. Did we succeed? No. Are we proud of the way we fought? Yes. Are we proud of every one of those hundreds of thousands of people who gave their all in that fight? Yes, we are. And we dust ourselves down and know that that struggle has to continue. And when we see what's happening in the United States and around the world and in this crisis, we know that there's no way that we uh, can give up. And I don't accept in any way, by the way, the conclusion from what I've just said that some people put forward, that, oh, the lesson to be learned is to drop the internationalist anti-war politics. I don't accept that for one minute uh, whatsoever. When you're really fighting to change things, the odds are always huge. The odds are always huge. We did win this time, but we can win again in my view. I agree that the constraints were obviously extraordinary, externally speaking. Um, and I think that had Labour even won the 2017 general election, you know, there would have been real barriers to actually fulfilling their key manifesto pledges. However, I'm talking about internally, Richard, you know, there wasn't open selection. Realistically, it may be the case that a left, a left winger can't even get on the ballot next time, or the reforms that were brought in will be rolled back. The democracy review was brought in. Ultimately, it didn't mean very much. It didn't really change very much. 
And when you look at things like the spy cops bill, you've still only got a couple of dozen Labour MPs dissenting and actually holding a, a morally principled a position on this. And I guess this feeds into, and, and by the way, I don't think anybody should leave the Labour Party. I, I'm a Labour Party member. I'll be staying as a Labour Party member, you know, an active one. But it does feed into a broader question is, isn't it hard to tell people, stay in the Labour Party, vote for change when people were in the Labour Party, they voted for left-wing slates, they did everything they were told for four years, and there wasn't even the most minor reform within the party. That's what I think most people would say is the failure. The external stuff, I think, was to, to a broad extent, if not inevitable, highly likely. What's your position on that before we move on in terms of a failure within the party to democratise Well, of it? course, there were huge forces against us in the party internally, particularly in the uh, parliamentary Labour Party and some of the, uh, the party uh, bureaucracy as well. But I don't think it was a total failure. And by the way, people's four, five years of activity in that period uh, did lead to outcomes. It led to two of the best general election manifestos ever put before the people. Policies now that people are looking back to, just wishing that the current Labour leadership would adopt policies even approaching that. And also you mentioned earlier uh, the number of left-wing MPs. I wish there were more left-wing MPs, but actually there's more left-wing MPs in the Parliamentary Labour Party than there has been uh, for decades. That's a fact. I think some people may be disappointed because some of the people who got in, they may be thought were more left-wing than they are, but that politics has always been like that in the Labour Party. You see people's politics put to the test when they become MPs, when they're put under pressure, and you see what decisions they take. But, you know, we've got uh, more left-wing Labour Party MPs than there has been for decades. The Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs is bigger than it's been uh, for a long time. So people shouldn't be defeated and shouldn't give up. But neither, of course, do I think that the struggle only takes place in the Labour Party. The struggle takes place inside the Labour Party, inside the trade unions and in social movements as well and in organisations uh, like uh, Stop the War and other internationalist organisations as well and anti-austerity campaigns. So I'm not just focused on the Labour Party. I think as a left, we need to be active in the Labour Party, not give up that terrain, but also be active in uh, movements outside the Labour Party uh, as well as the, as the left in the party has always been. Moving on to Keir Starmer a bit more concretely. Uh, do you think he misled the membership when he ran for leader uh, last year? And I'm thinking in particular now, of course, because we're seeing the transition of power in the United States, Joe Biden, president-elect. When he was speaking to LBC late last year, Keir Starmer thought it was inappropriate to comment on who he would rather see in the White House. Yet at a hustings, when running for leader, he said, we have to get rid of Trump. Biden is clearly uh, my preferred candidate. Do, do you think that tells us a broader story about Keir Starmer? not really telling the membership entirely who he was when running for leader? Well, if Keir had stuck and if Keir does going forward stick to the pledges he put before the membership, then I think very few left members would have uh, any complaints because basically uh, his manifesto said uh, he'd by and large keep uh, the radical economic policies in particular of 2017 and 2019, uh, and that he would move the party forward in his own way, but he would stick to those policies. But I think people have been shocked at the way that the party approached the spy cops bill, at the way the party approached the overseas operations bill, and the way the party leadership uh, failed to stand by uh, teachers and school staff in their hour of need. Uh, at that point, people are disappointed, but people learn uh, the uh, the lessons, don't they? You know, of course, I wish that uh, Becky had been uh, elected leader. Uh, she wasn't. Uh, so that was a democratic vote. We move on. I worked to try and get Keir Starmer into number 10 and uh, get a Labour government. But I think the way that we get that Labour government and get Keir Starmer into 10 Downing Street is by ensuring that the party comes forward with the policies uh, that we need uh, in order to meet the crisis people are going through. And when we're talking about errors, I'd say that in politics, errors in tactics are always forgivable and happen. Errors in competence and delivery uh, are often uh, forgivable and often happen. What isn't really forgivable uh, are basically errors in principle, 
failures of principle. So we need to ensure that as a party, we abide by the democratic socialist principles that the Labour Party was founded upon, particularly during a crisis. I suppose uh, that's obviously true. Clearly, Keir Summers won the leadership of the party. Every MP has to work with him and they try to exert influence. But I do wonder, clearly, you know, the, the, the Corbyn years were quite unique in British politics, in, in, in a way for either party, of having this backbencher come from nowhere and becoming the leader and actually contesting two general elections. And clearly there was a, a point that was uh, realised by Keir Sam and people around him that to a certain extent he wouldn't be able to win the leadership unless he had a concrete policy offer which resembled that of Jeremy Corbyn, like you said, Corbynism without Corbyn. But the evidence since then suggests that that isn't really on the table. Uh, in a number of ways. We've seen a number of pledges which have been effectively just discarded. For instance, voting through the Brexit deal. I'm not going to talk about the, the politics of whether or not Labour should have voted for it. I think there's arguments both ways. But one of Keir Starmer's pledges was that, you know, uh, any deal that Labour would back in terms of leading the European Union would protect freedom of movement. Now, that hasn't happened when he's whipped Labour MPs to vote for Boris Johnson's Brexit deal. We are seeing a lot of repeated repudiations of those uh, those 10 promises. I mean, is, is there a point for you personally or for the Socialist Campaign Group where if Labour was to discard a certain policy or to distance itself from something, you would say, actually, that's not acceptable. You're not being the person you claimed you were to the membership in, in 2020. Well, things have been done already that aren't acceptable. I think the party's policy on the spy cops bill, look at the way that those undercover police officers infiltrated trade unions and other progressive campaigns, uh, abused women uh, and the rest of it. I think the party's position on that was totally unacceptable. Uh, I, I think that the party's being so behind the curve when it came to the issue uh, of the health and safety of teachers, school staff, and therefore pupils in the wider community was unacceptable uh, as well. But I mean, look, Jeremy Corbyn and others remained uh, Labour MPs uh, doing their bit and left Labour members remain being left Labour members when Tony Blair took us into an illegal war uh, in Iraq and we're not at that uh, position at the moment, are we? So I think in the context of this crisis, uh, the leadership will become acutely aware uh, or should become acutely aware that tinkering around the edges and managerialism isn't enough, that there will be big public support for uh, radical interventions to help people through this crisis. So I think what people are finding is that being the leadership of a political party isn't as easy as it seems when you're not the leadership uh, of the party. So obviously people are on a learning curve uh, themselves and I hope that the lessons of the last few months can be learned, just as we need to learn the lessons of that uh, disastrous defeat in 2019 uh, too. Do you not think there's a very real chance of a repeat of the 1980s, where you have a very timid Labour leadership, then it was Neil Kinnock, wouldn't back the miners' strike, wouldn't back various social struggles. Uh, you see the ascent of Thatcherism. It wasn't just driven by the Conservatives, but it was also made possible by the emergence of the SDP, the centre asserting itself, and of course the Labour right, uh, ultimately nullifying any grassroots left, having a presence in, in parliamentary politics. Do you think the same, the same thing could happen this time? Because we've had Kinnock, we've had Blair, and like you said, even with the Iraq war, the Labour left didn't really push back perhaps as much as it could have. Uh, obviously, that would have meant perhaps leaving the party. I'm not suggesting they should have done that. But that's the baseline, isn't it? We, we've seen this before of somebody talking left going very far right very quickly. Is there is there going to be a point where actually people say, this is just unacceptable? And, and what would the response look like? Well, I think two things show that uh, people were right not to leave the Labour Party even in the aftermath of the uh, Iraq war. Firstly, the fact Jeremy became leader of the Labour Party shows it was correct to stay within the Labour Party. And secondly, of course, the, the trade union link uh, and the trade unions that gave birth to the Labour Party show that it's right to stay uh, within the Labour Party. And the fact that under our electoral system, the Labour Party is the only party that can take power uh, in the interests of the working class uh, in this uh, country. I mean, the example you mentioned in the 80s is interesting. Of course, that could happen again. But it's down to us to ensure that it doesn't. And it's an interesting case study, isn't it? In that Kinnock actually was from the overt left in the 1970s. Uh, he then failed to back Tony Benn to become deputy 
uh, leader against Dennis Healy. And that was a significant step on his road to the right. And then he came into the leadership from the left as such and then betrayed uh, the miners, uh, turned his back on Liverpool when Liverpool was fighting back against uh, Thatcher's cuts. And he sadly uh, lost uh, two uh, elections. So, of course, uh, that could happen again. But I just urge all Labour Party members uh, to learn the lessons from uh, history because many people can talk left and not be on the left when it comes to it. And, of course, there will be future leadership elections in years to come. Hopefully, after Keir has been uh, Prime Minister, there will be future uh, leadership elections and future deputy leadership elections. And I hope that members, and I'm sure that members will, uh, learn the experience, uh, learn from the experience of everything that's happened uh, since uh, 2015. Do you think Labour MPs, certain Labour MPs, supported a people's vote, a second referendum on membership of the European Union, in order to hobble the former leadership? Do you think that was their primary reasoning for backing it, rather than actually believing in the importance or even the possibility of reversing Brexit? Well, I think some people were pretty disingenuous uh, when it came to that. In politics, people often, unfortunately, uh, use this tactic or that tactic to uh, achieve their outcome. And I think there were some, some whose enthusiasm for a second referendum uh, was partly because they thought this was an issue whereby they could unpick the coalition of progressives that supported uh, Jeremy. I think in a minority of cases, that was the case. I do think the vast majority of members of the PLP who took the position of wanting um, a second referendum took so because of the, um, the the way their constituency had voted in the referendum in 2016 uh, and because of their own personal views. But of course, I think there was a minority that did uh, approach in that opportunistic, disingenuous way, unfortunately. Were you surprised when Jeremy Corbyn was suspended from the Labour Party uh, after he responded to the HRC report and its findings? Jeremy is a Labour Party member. Jeremy is a member of Parliament. We've got the ridiculous situation where despite being a Labour member and a member of Parliament, he's not a Labour member of Parliament. I and others have been fighting to get Jeremy restored to the Parliamentary Labour Party, to get him back as a Labour MP. That has to happen, and that has to happen now. We need to unite, yes, and take the fight to the Tories, but it's really hard for the party to unite when one of the leading socialists in the history of the party is being excluded from the Parliamentary Labour Party in this way. Do you not think that's a very real possibility that come 2024, he still won't have the whip restored, which for our, our audience would mean that he would still be an MP, he'd still be a Labour member, but he formally wouldn't be a sitting Labour MP in Parliament. He wouldn't have the whip restored and the approach from the Labour leadership would be effectively to choose another candidate to contest uh, the general election in his constituency. I mean, that seems like the most predictable way of this playing out, doesn't it? Because that way, Starmer avoids conflict. He gets rid of somebody who he views as a, as a political problem. Uh, and it may be unprincipled. It may look very slippery. But to most people who aren't that familiar with politics, don't have that much information about you know, the, the, the issue, it kind of would pass them by. Do you think that's possibly where this ends up? Well, we can't allow it to end up there. When we're talking about timeframes, you know, we need Jeremy back in the parliamentary Labour Party now, I'm not prepared to countenance the possibility of this dragging on for years in the way that you suggest. We all know that there are some in the Labour Party who don't want Jeremy to be even a member of the Labour Party, never mind the parliamentary Labour Party. But I can't countenance that possibility. We can't allow that to happen. We've got to fight to get Jeremy back into the parliamentary Labour Party. This isn't the first time in the party's history this kind of thing has happened. And Nairon Bevan, who went on, of course, to found the National Health Service, he was expelled from the Labour Party for six months. Michael Foote, who went on to lead the Labour Party, uh, was expelled uh, from uh, the Labour Party for a period as well. But I do think it's the first time that a former leader of the Labour Party uh, has been uh, treated in this way, apart from Ramsay MacDonald, of course, who uh, 
got what he deserved when it uh, followed his betrayal by joining up with the uh, Conservatives to form that uh, national government and keep uh, austerity um, uh, in place. So it's a totally unacceptable uh, situation. Jeremy needs to be back uh, in the parliamentary uh, Labour Party. Um, and, you know, and those of us, such as myself, will continue to call for that, continue to fight for that, because it's the right thing to do. Final question, Richard. Thanks for thanks for everything. Thanks for a great interview. Lots of, uh, I think, really straightforward answers, which you don't often hear. What next for the Labour left? Uh, and I don't just mean, obviously, the Labour MPs, but I mean Labour members and so on. And let's just say COVID is almost not an issue in terms of civil society and people being able to meet each other by the end of this year. How do you see this year inflecting politics for the Labour left? Well, what the Labour left has got to do uh, is operate uh, as a left within the Labour Party and obviously operate uh, in wider currents outside, outside the Labour Party uh, as well. Uh, there's going to be no shortage uh, of struggles to fight, both in this country and in terms of campaigning for peace and against war uh, around the world. So I think the left in the Labour Party uh, needs to get organised to get left candidates selected in those seats particularly those that we sadly lost at the last general election, because, of course, there are a number of seats, a number of seats that voted to leave the EU that we narrowly lost at the last general election, having not lost them before. So we've got a good chance of winning those at the next general election. And we should make sure that left Labour candidates uh, are, are selected uh, in those seats. And where MPs retire as well, we should be organising to ensure that good left candidates selected there as well. The left in the party needs to be campaigning, I think, for a zero COVID uh, policy, as has been uh, pursued uh, in, for example, um, uh, New Zealand uh, and uh, in Vietnam uh, and elsewhere. And the Labour left needs to be fighting with the trade unions in their campaigns uh, against job losses and against the scandalous uh, blueprint that's now being used of firing people in order to rehire them on substantially inferior pay terms and conditions. I don't think that the world is going to become any more of a safe place. I'm delighted that Trump was booted out uh, of uh, the White House, uh, but I don't think that people should assume that Biden's uh, policy when it comes to the rest of the world is going to be a, a policy that's un problematic. And I do think that we could find ourselves in a situation where the left is having to mobilise uh, in this country and internationally to campaign against war, uh, against bombings, and of course, uh, against inhumane sanctions and other uh, policies. But really, the left needs to be propositional, not just oppositional. We were propositional in 2017 and 2019, and propositional in 2015, when we took the leadership uh, of the Labour Party. And that's the lesson we've got to learn because in politics, it can't be just what you're against, against, against. It's got to be what you're for as well. And I do think that left policy solutions, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to public services, when it comes to housing, when it comes to education, I think that those left policy solutions can genuinely uh, be the solutions for the problems that people in our communities are facing. And people are looking for solutions. And I believe that the left has the ideas and the courage to provide those solutions. But ultimately, the left can't give up. It's very easy, I know, after five or six years of intense struggle, of five or six years of being relentlessly attacked by the establishment, of five or six years of being disappointed in people that you may be looked up to, then they get into positions of power and let you down. It's very easy to give up. But I look to other countries around the world where people with politics not too dissimilar from our own have faced greater odds than us, faced greater prices than us, and have fought and won despite that. Look at Bolivia, for example, where the former socialist president of Bolivia had to go into exile. His life was in danger. People were killed for supporting socialist policies in that country. But now, after the fact that they didn't give up, things have been turned around 
and they have a socialist government there again. Obviously, the situation in our country is different, but there are some lessons to be learnt. And the lessons are, if they can carry on fighting, then so can we. So whether it's for an economic policy that's progressive, whether it's for anti-war internationalism, whether it's for standing up for the rights of the Palestinian people, all of these principles are non-negotiable and we can't give up on them. We can't give up on them in the aftermath of that, aftermath of that disastrous election defeat in 2019 and we can't give up uh, on them now when many people are feeling, feeling disillusioned. I believe there's so much talent in the grassroots left across our country, talent individually and great potential collectively. I think we can learn the lessons, both of the successes and the defeats of not only the past five years, but the past 45 years and more, and move forward to victories in the future. So I think we shouldn't give up. I think there's still a world to win. I think together we can win it. Richard, it's a very passionate way to, to start the year. Uh, I, I just got one quick question for you. What's the one thing you'd like to see in 2021? The one thing I'd like to see uh, in 2021 is the government adopt a zero COVID strategy because it's the only way to save lives to the level that's needed. And it's the only way to save livelihoods and get the economy going. And after that, we have to start fighting to build a fairer, better economy that does work in the interest of the vast majority in this country. But I think a zero COVID approach by the government is a prerequisite to much to to most things that could happen that could be good happening in the year ahead. Richard Bergen, you've been excellent. Thanks for joining us here on Downstream at Navarro Media. I hope you have a wonderful 2021. And you, my pleasure. Always refreshing to speak to Richard Bergen, such an honest speaker. And if you want to see more interviews like that over the course of 2021, go to navarromedia.com forward slash support. We want to talk about the huge stories of this year, articles, videos, and podcasts and your support makes that possible. Go to navaramedia.com forward slash support. My name's Aaron Bastani. This has been Downstream. Good night.